When did you go into the army? I was uh, drafted in April 1st. I was told to report 1969. 1969. And you um, went into the army as a conscientious objector. Yes. What was, what was your thinking? What was the point of view that you had that led you to uh, be a conscientious objector? Well, I, I was raised very strict Seventh-day Adventist, and right. my uh, mother and father both knew about Desmond T. Doss. They had given me that book when I was in high school, and so I was aware of that, but uh, was raised strict Seventh-day Adventist. And, and in fact, my uh, father and his father, my grandfather, were both very, very anti-military. They did not want me to go. Right, and you say that you actually did spend a little bit of time in Mexico, is that right? My, my grandfather gave me a brand new Suzuki X6 Hustler motorcycle to leave the country. My parents were separated. I lived with my mother mm. and my grandfather secretly bought that took it to his place and his place was about a mile from the school, my high school. And after class one morning, I, my sister was one year ahead of me. I watched her, um, made sure she left the lobby. And then I secretly walked over to my grandfather's house, got on the motor motorcycle and rode to Mexico. I spent that night in, in Tijuana on the Mexican side my mother had no clue of what was happening. The next morning I rode down below in Mexico, down below Arizona and went down, started down into Mexico. I was stopped by the Mexican uh, border patrol at a checkpoint uh, because I had no papers, they turned me around and I rode back up to Lukeville on the Arizona side, filled a tank with gas, sat there thinking, and I thought, this isn't how I want to live my life. Hmm. I called my mother and told her where I was, asked her not to notify the police or sheriff uh, that I would be home in two days. I rode back up to uh, Southern California, spent that night in Mexicali, and rode home the next day. Now, when you said you didn't want to live your life like this, you didn't want to live your life this way, what, what do you mean by that? You mean, does that mean running away from obligations to your country? Or what, what do you mean by that, that you didn't want to live this way? I, I didn't want to uh, run away from responsibility. Mm. And I was had been told that if I went to Vietnam that I would die mm. and but I felt that it would be I was running away from responsibility uh, I had respect for America and I felt that it was my duty to report uh, if I had to be drafted if I had to uh, but I had not registered at that time. I, I was still 17, so I had not registered. Oh, okay. It sounds like had you been among those who went to Canada, that that would have been okay with your dad and your grandfather. Is that right? Yes, my, my father was in Mexico, and that was the reason for going to Mexico. I see, okay. And so... That wouldn't have been a problem for them had you, you know, just left the country either in Mexico or Canada and just avoided service altogether. They, they did not want me to be in the military. Before I left, my grandfather had talked to me about other ways to wow. uh, uh, be discharged should I be drafted uh, or he, other ways to not be uh, inducted if I were drafted. Yeah. Uh, they gave me all kinds of ways to avoid wow. being active in the military. Now, 
was this, you said you were raised Seventh-day Adventist. So what they were telling you and what they were encouraging you to do, was that driven primarily by religious commitment, driven primarily by, um, for lack of a better phrase, anti-Americanism, um, driven by, by just a more generalized pacifism? What, what was motivating them to put time and energy into actively discouraging you from serving in the, in the military? It, it was that they did not want me to die. Mm -hmm. uh, that was their uh, motivation. It wasn't any other. I was going to be a non-combatant, so that was fine with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Or, and, uh, but it, they just, and, and they told me many times, if you go to Vietnam, you'll die. When I got back home, I took the motorcycle back to my grandfather and said, you can have it back. I didn't keep my part of the deal. And he looked at me and he said, no, keep it, ride it, enjoy it, because if you're drafted, you'll die. Yeah. And that was the end of that conversation. Sounds like a pretty grim conversation. So you're, you're drafted in 69, is that right? 1969? Yes. At what point um, in the process did you let the Army know that you were a conscientious objector? Was it, uh, you know, the beginning of boot camp, after boot camp, at what point did you, did you let the army know that you would serve, but as a conscientious objector? That was right at the very beginning. Uh, I knew when I went in uh, that I would be, uh, I assumed I would be a, a medic. Mm. And when I was drafted, uh, they took us down to Fresno and that's where we were sworn in. Uh, they bust us over to Fort Ord and that's where we got the haircuts. Mm. And while I was at Fort Ord, uh, they already knew that I was a non-combatant. And so when the group would go for uh, weapons training, they would recycle me to the next group, next group, next group. And I did KP for about a week to two weeks because I kept getting pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. Wow. Until they flew me back to San Antonio for San Houston. Now, in Vietnam, you were in many combat situations. Did your status as a non combatant hold? I mean, regardless of what happened in your time in Vietnam, throughout your service, I mean, were you ever in a position where you, you did pick up a weapon? No, I never picked up a weapon. Uh, when I was uh, uh, with the headquarters company, second of the 14th, they offered me a sidearm. Uh, they handed, they held it out to me uh, to take, and I did not. When I was first attached to Delta Company, the very first morning we were going out on the first operation, uh, one of the grunts jim Deppy came over and asked where's your weapon doc i told him i don't carry one i'm a conscientious objector and wow. he in a very hostile voice said f you if the if it hits the fan you're on your own and he walked away and i thought oh my gosh that's what they think of me i went over to him after a while said jim i'm sorry you feel that way but if it does hit the fan i'll be there for you and that was the end of it well, that's what I wanted to ask you about, because, you know, obviously for the guys out in the field who are dealing with the ambushes and the punji sticks and the firefights and all of that stuff, um, you could understand how, you know, they might, you know, have hostile feelings toward a, a non-combatant conscientious objector. At the same time, there's great admiration for the medic. Right. Everyone speaks with fondness and respect uh, for the medic. So how did that, you know, how did that end up playing for you uh, as things worked out? Um, you know, how did that relationship go uh, with the soldiers you served with in the field? Well, it, I was not aware of any uh, hostility or any lack of respect 
uh, they took care of me. Um, Jim Deppy, uh, when he was getting short toward the end of his time in Vietnam, uh, senior grunts were offered or asked what position would you want to man? And he would at times shout out, I'll be Doc's bodyguard. Mm. So it went from FU to Doc's bodyguard. <laughs> yeah, and so, right, if they understand, we need to take care of Doc because Doc's going to take care of us. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. You know, it, it was, when I first went out, uh, I started to walk over to look at something that was, I thought was odd or out of place, and they started shouting, freeze, Doc, freeze, and I did. They came over and asked, what are you doing? And I said, I wanted to go look at that. And they said, don't you ever walk and look at anything. If you want to do that, you want to see something, you tell us first, we'll go check it out, then you can go. And I not one time ever after that uh, asked them to check anything out. When we took a break, I sat on my fanny because I didn't ever want to put them at risk or myself at risk. Hmm. Yeah, that, that medic is, is so important. Um, there are a number of things that you've written about uh, in um, uh, an essay that's in, in um, a book called When We Came Home, where you have a, a short memoir that's there. And I just wanna ask you about, about some of them um, without you know, without getting into areas that, um, that you don't want to talk about. Um, you mentioned that one of the things you did um, was that you, in addition to being a medic for the US soldiers, that also you did medical work in villages and in, in Vietnamese villages, South Vietnamese villages. And also that, that you would have villagers come to you when you were at a fire base. Um, is that right? Can you talk a little bit about that, that aspect of the work? The, um, uh, in Vietnam, we had what's called uh, MEDCAPS and that's the Medical Civil Action Program. And so we would go in the villages and we would take the nurse and doctors and myself as a medic and the villagers would bring their sick, their injured, their sick, their children for us to us for treatment. And that was a regular routine. And that was one of the most enjoyable things because the children were just wonderful. Mm. Uh, they were, they were out, outstanding. We had uh, villagers, gentlemen, and, and mothers and others, uh, or even children uh, that were in severe medical uh, problems, with severe medical problems. They would come to the fire support base and, and uh, they would be brought in and we would treat them there also. What sorts of things would you see? Would it be, you know, just accidents kids have? Um, maybe somebody, some civilian trip to mine? What, what sorts of things do you remember seeing? Well, specifically, uh, we had one gentleman with an a injury next to his eye. I have photographs of the nurse mm -hmm. treating that. Mm -hmm. And uh, just like any injuries or any high fevers for the children, on one occasion, we, uh, we medevaced off, called in a, a dust off. Mm -hmm. uh, the dust off was the, the uh, helicopter ambulances. Uh, we called them dust off. But we had a mother and child uh, taken to the hospital at the base camp because the child was in severe medical uh, distress. I, I'm not certain what it was. I just uh, carried the stretcher with the child out to the helicopter. Mm -hmm. But it was whatever they needed. Uh, if it appeared necessary, they would be bring, brought on post for treatment. Do you remember, um, you know, this is part of the hearts and minds effort, right? Trying to win, you know, yes. win the, the hearts and minds of folks to the, the cause of an independent yes. South, South Vietnam. 
uh, that the U.S. is, you know, trying to help help bring that about. Um, so there's that side. Do you remember there ever being a sense of tension, though, ever any of your fellow soldiers ever ever wondering if some of these folks were actually these folks coming to us, if some of them were actually Viet Cong? Was that ever a concern or a thought that went through your mind? We knew, yes, we were very aware that probably the Papa Sons that came with injuries uh, may have received those injuries trying to set booby traps for us. The area I was in was primarily booby trapped and we treated them and sent them out. And there are stories of, of Papa Sons that we did that were treated that were caught in the wire uh, trying to uh, attack us during the night. You know, we knew that. And one of the interesting things about time in Vietnam when I was there was we knew every person in the village or we assumed every person in the village would shoot us and kill us in a heartbeat because they really didn't want us there. Wow. So, so I'm interested now in what's motivating you to, to help. Now I'm guessing one reason you help is because you've been ordered to, and you know, that's just on your list of duties. Um, but back to the, you know, you were raised Seventh-day Adventist. Did you, as you're thinking about this situation, you know, as you're treating a person, helping a person, having a, a pretty, you know, pretty good sense that this person within the past few days or within the next few days, um, what you know could kill me maybe wanted to get me or will want to get me um as you're dealing with that situation how how are you processing that in your own mind i mean are you do you have a sense of commitment that springs from your seventh day adventist training um and that's how you're interpreting this you know sort of the classic love your enemies kind of thing or is it just I'm doing my duty and that's all I'm doing? How are you processing this really complicated situation? It, it, it was just simply, this is what needs to be done and I'm doing my duty. I, uh, I, we were aware of it and we all knew it and you just, put that aside and do what needs to be done. Wow. You're there pretty late in the war. I mean, late in the sense that by the time you're there, you know, a, a lot of folks have lost confidence that the that South Vietnam is going to be able to stand on its own. Certainly that process is underway when, when you're there. Yes. Um, you know, you're in this bizarre situation where you're helping people whom, who you know, either they are the enemy or likely are collaborating with the enemy. What was your own thinking about the war itself? Did, at, when you were there, did, did the military effort make sense to you? Did the war make sense to you? Um, you know, did you did you feel like you know this is a winnable mission? What what was your own feeling about the war itself, given your personal experience? That that's an interesting question. When I first arrived in Vietnam, I thought that we were there to help, and that the Vietnamese were wanted us and were happy we were there. It didn't take long to learn that we weren't there to win the war. Uh, I, I started at the, about the 1st of November uh, out in the field, and it quickly changed from uh, we were there to win to we were there to take care of each other and come home alive. And our focus we did exactly what we were asked to do, told to do completely with not, without any reservation, but we also did it not to, 
save Vietnam, but to save each other and come home alive. Wow. Wow. One of the quotes that I took from the essay you wrote, and this is the reason why I was asking about the villagers a minute ago, is you write that half of your platoon at one point had been blown away by two mamasans. Um, and again, without asking you to get into details you don't want to get into, can you tell us a little bit about what, what happened? What was that situation there? Yeah. We, uh, to, to take a break from being out on operations, there was a Venice East, it, we called it, it was a four bunker complex set up on 55 gallon drums because it was in a swamp area. And in the morning, half of the uh, platoon would go road sweep to the village, a dirt road, and half the platoon would go road sweep for mines to the main paved highway. And because it was just a piece of cake, easy place, I, the medic, I didn't have to go. I asked them to wake me up in the morning because I wanted to go to the village and take pictures. They came in, woke me up, and I just laid there and said, no, I'm too lazy, too sleepy. Mm -hmm. They came back again. I got up. I sat on the edge of the cot, laid back down, and said, no, I'm too lazy. Well, the group that went to the trunk lab, one of the one of the grunts had received a care package with candy bars and he had taken it, Ron Christian's his name, and he had taken those candy bars to give to the children. After they completed the road sweep, they were handing out candy bars to the children. Two mama sons with command, Dayton, command detonated Claymore mines blew that group away. And Ron Christian was killed instantly. And I didn't know until later, that was Christmas Eve, but I didn't know till later what had happened later that day. And I've always felt guilty that I wasn't there. Hmm. To help them when they needed it. It's a theme that comes up um, a couple times in the in the essay you wrote, um, and you speak of it specifically as a medic. It's similar to other memories. Actually, this morning I was just talking with a, an army veteran who was in Vietnam same time you were. Uh, he was up in I Corps though, up in northern northern South Vietnam. You were in Three Corps. And after his tour was up, he went home, as you know, most people did, um, without extending, although you did extend, I want to ask you about that, but he, you know, he didn't extend, he went home, and then a buddy of his was killed in combat. And, you know, he says to this day that that's a burden that he feels that, you know, he feels like he abandoned, you know, his guys. Um, you, you bring this up, um, a couple times, you process this in your mind again and again, you go through it. When you think of a, a soldier who did not survive battle wounds, it's a soldier you worked on and, and you, you rehearse that in your mind again and again, and you wonder, you know, could I have done something differently uh, that would have led to a, a different outcome? So I guess first I want to ask is what I described, is that, is that correct? I mean, is that something that is just sort of a continual presence in your life since Vietnam? Just that thought of as a medic, could I have done something differently? Should I have done something differently? Is that one of the things you carry from the war? Yes. My first casualty was the person that kind of took me under his wing, was explaining everything that was going on and kind of 
informing me of what to expect and and um, he was my first casualty we were out on an ambush <clears throat> he was shot and i found out the next morning that he had died and i sat on the berm by myself on the fire support based berm and cried I went to the medical doctor and told him what I had done and asked him if I had done it correct, could I have done anything different? And he said, no, what I described was exactly correct. <clears throat> and that never goes away. That dust off arrived about 10 o'clock at night. It was very dark. We were out in the rice paddy. There was about four or six inches of water. My friend was sitting in the water with a sucking chest wound. I bandaged it, put him on the stretcher when the helicopter landed. They started shouting, get him off, get him off. And I asked why I'm standing there at the door. And they showed me Claymore mine wires that were attached somehow to him or to that stretcher. And wow. they were hanging out that door and if they had taken off they would have taken claymore mines hanging under the helicopter standing there i knew i was grounded the the skids of the helicopter were in water so i knew it was grounded i took out my scissors knowing that the rotors do cause static electricity and i thought if i if there is any i'm gonna blow us all up but I cut those wires, held them up to show the medic, and they took off. And I was actually surprised nothing exploded, but I was not going to let them take my friend off that helicopter. Mm. Yeah. And did he make it? He died. That was the time I cried the next morning. Oh, I see. So So how does this work for you now? Is it that you is it a tape that plays in your mind and you're looking for that you know the little thing I could have done differently or or is it the recognition that the doctor told you you did it all you did it all right uh but still just the situation so awful, it's just a burden. And, and I realize I'm asking you to address something that really is just, it can't be understood by someone who hasn't been there. So there's no possible way that I can really, or anyone else who hasn't experienced it can really understand um, what you're saying. But, you know, what is, what are these sets of memories like for you in your life uh these you know several decades after the war where we're you know over 50 years now past um past these events but clearly they are still with you in a very profound way is it a is it a tape that plays in your mind is it a sensation what what is it with you how do these how do these memories live with you I think about it often, and I, when I arrived home, a World War II veteran that had been a POW in Germany told me, it will never go away, it will always seem like yesterday. Mm. And I thought you meant well, but things fade and they're dismissed in time and you don't think about them, but uh, Vietnam, some of the intense occasions they don't fade it's almost like it just happened i think about that often and i had nothing to do with the military until just recently i started going to counseling and that has helped me deal with some of the things that i needed to deal with and i told the counselor on one occasion if john Robinson made it to heaven and he's looking down. 
I know he knows. I did everything I could do to save his life. And I take comfort in that. Mm. You've mentioned, I believe, Ron Christian, is that right? Ron Christian was the uh, one that died instantly. And I think there were six uh, Americans that died during that ambush uh, from the Mamasans, but Ron Christian was specifically one, yes. And then also John Robertson also was killed in action or yeah, died. Uh, as John Robinson, yeah, that was a, an error. Uh, it was hostile fire, but he was my first casualty. That was in November 14, 1969. And um, the ambush at the Trunglap village was December 24, Christmas Eve. And these are two, I'm assuming these are two of what you say are the 13 names on, on the Vietnam Memorial yes. Wall that, that, I mean, there are 13 names on the wall, names that represent individuals you knew personally. 13 names in Delta Company, second of the 14th, in first, second or third platoon and Echo Company. Uh, I was put on Echo Company right at the very end. But those people uh, I went out with or knew personally uh, during my six months plus, it was a little longer than six months uh, for my replacement to arrive. Wow. There's another event that you mentioned briefly in what you wrote, and now you're at an evacuation hospital. A Chinook, if I remember correctly, was shot down. Um, they were killed as a result of that. They're also wounded. And as you relate the story, if I have it right, you are talking with the guy at the evacuation hospital. Um, he explains to you, you know, what he can about what happened. Um, and then you say that, you know, after talking with him and hearing the story of the Chinook that was shot down, you say, I went outside and was, was physically sick. Do I, do I have that um, description correct? Yes, that was my 21st birthday. I, at that time, was back at uh, 2nd of the 14th headquarters in Kuchi Base Camp, 25th Infantry Base Camp. And I had put money on the bar in the NCO club. I was E5 at that point mm. and had planned to celebrate my 25th birthday or 21st birthday. And right after we started, uh, Sergeant Jerry Kahn came in and told us a Chinook had been shot down at the Mushroom. And that was one of the places where we operated. And some of Delta Company were on that. He didn't know how many and he didn't know who. And that put a damper on our, mm. our uh, celebration. Uh, the next morning, I heard that there were at 12th Evac Hospital in Kuchi, uh, there were two patients from Delta Company. I went over and Harlan Metzger uh, was able to escape and he described the Chinook was rocking. It was kind of on a rice paddy berm and he tried, he knew he needed to get out. It was on fire and he tried to get out. His body was squeezed. He went back inside, tried to get out again. His body was squeezed because of the rocking. Mm. He went back inside and he said, I, I knew I was going to die if I didn't get out. And he said he, he was able to get out and described what the situation was like. And when I went outside, I was, I, I threw up. So mm -hmm. what really stands out to me though, and, and here's, you know, here's where we get to one of the odd or mysterious things about the world of war. The paragraph in which you describe this, it, it ends with, that sentence, when our visit ended, I went outside and was physically sick. And then the, the sentence that begins the next paragraph says, I extended my time in Vietnam. 
I wonder if you could talk about that because, you know, given everything you've said here, you know, I think most people would think, oh, well, gosh, of course he would want to get the heck out of Vietnam as quickly as he, as he could. And in fact, most soldiers did. When their time was up, their time was up. And they were going home, they're getting on the freedom bird. You extended your time in Vietnam. How, how would you explain that or just discuss that, these events that are so awful um, but you decided to extend your, your time. So what's your response to that? As an infantry combat medic, I was first in, last out on every air assault. I was out on every ambush patrol, even if it was half a platoon or whatever, the medic always had to be there. And so I was always out in the field every, time it was needed. And after I was taken offline back in division, huge base camp, it felt like I was in my mother's arms. Mm. I had issues that occurred in America that were unpleasant during my tour. And I didn't have the desire or the person to come back to America to be with. Mm. And I, as a combat medic, had an attitude. Being a combat medic is both the worst job in the world and the best job in the world. They couldn't put me on any details. They couldn't harass me. They couldn't mess with me because I could just tell them. And one of the jokes medics have is you can tell infantry where to go with no fear. Mm. And that's very true. Mm -hmm. because they took care of us and they uh, let, let us be. And uh, so back at Coochie Division, I felt safe. I didn't want to be back stateside in the service because I knew I had a major attitude and I knew I wouldn't want to put up with any bullshit, any military bullshit. Mm -hmm. And so I extended so I could get a drop when I came home. Meaning get out immediately? Yes. And when I came home, when we came home at that time, not only did you get released from active duty, but you had no active reserve. So I had four more years, but it was inactive reserve. So I didn't have to go attend anything. I was done. Was it also, you know, as you reflect back on the decision to extend you don't want to come back to the States, 69, 70, that's a hard time to be a soldier in the United States. Um, there are other things happening in the family, et cetera. Um, is part of your decision to extend also that as hard as this job was, that it was, and you say it was also the best job because there's a lot of nonsense you didn't have to deal with, but is, is part of it also that it was just incredibly meaningful work? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't really know how to answer that. I, 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 well, let me, I had, become close friends with our medical service corps officer, Lieutenant Clee, first lieutenant. And he was there at Coochie and, and uh, we, we had, and he had taken care of me and helped me during different things while I was out in the field, but we became close. And so he couldn't as a Lieutenant go to enlisted men's clubs and I couldn't go to officers clubs as an E5. And yeah. so we would go to the opposite side as far away from our unit as possible. And I would put on civilian clothes. He'd wear his officer's uniform mm -hmm. and we would have pizza and beer. And on oh. one occasion, he wanted to wear his civilian clothes. And after hours, you could wear civilian clothes. However, to drive a vehicle, you had to be in uniform. Mm -hmm. So he gave me his first lieutenant's uniform and I put it on, drove the Jeep over to the 
officers clubs and we're sitting in the officer club having pizza and beer mm -hmm. three infantry officers from delta delta company came in uh captains looked at us their mouth kind of dropped open they came over sat down had pizza and beer with us not a word was said then or after and 45 years later i was meeting in redmond washington with captain um, our medical doctor and uh, lieutenant clee and the nurse and Luke clay asked me do you remember the mps stopping us when you were wearing my uniform and i said no he said yeah one night as we were driving back to our base the mps stopped us questioned us for a while let us go and we went on and i laughed and i said i guess i acted like an officer in addition to that lieutenant clay when when i was before i was back at kuchi uh, when I first arrived in Vietnam, if you wanted to go someplace, you could walk up to any helicopter truck or do, and if, if they were going where you wanted to go and they had room, they'd give you a ride. They changed that to you need, needed orders, travel orders. Mm. Well, being medic and having access to the, the uh, office, I went over and got a copy of the travel orders. I made me a graph of a bunch of copies off and hid them. When Clee wanted to go someplace, I would ask him, where do you want to go? How long do you want to go? And I would fill out that form and I would forge the officer's commander's signature and Clee went all over the place. So we kind of did fun things also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I'm getting insight into why you don't want to come back to the States and uh, deal with military regulations and, and all of that. This. <laughs> This work that you you were doing as a medic, um, and you've described sort of you know different sides of it. There there were advantages to it that you can look back on now and and you know look back with a you know a, a light view uh, you know humorous things. They're the very hard things, um, but this obviously is very important work i mean this is work that you're doing in the field that is of fundamental importance this is why the medic is so loved so protected so honored by the soldiers because the medic's work is so important as you just reflect on your life as a whole would you say that your work as a medic in vietnam was maybe the most important work you ever did? You know, when I was in Vietnam as a medic, I did not feel important. I, I did, uh, one of the things I always did when I was out on, guard, uh, on an ambush patrol is I was not armed, but I always did guard duty. As a guard, I always had the radio. And so I did situation reps. Mm -hmm. And I always had a rifleman beside me that knew if I woke him up, it was serious. So, uh, but as a medic, I did not feel important. I just went this last October to the very first Delta Company 1969-70 reunion. And one of the guys there, and I said, I didn't feel I was important. One of the guys there, when he stood up to tell his story and what he's been doing after, pointed at me and he said, I know what a brave son of a bitch that man is. Mm. Because his first, first day out, I was given a, uh, written up for a silver star, but given a bronze star. Uh, mm. But I didn't feel important. I just had to be there. I didn't pay any attention to where we were going, why we were going. I had no clue. I didn't go to any any uh, re, uh, reviews of of our operations for the day or plans for the day because I just had to be there. <clears throat> I want to I want to come back. You mentioned the Silver Star, Bronze Star. I want to come back and ask you about that. Um, but kind of picking up on what you're just saying about the veteran, the other combat veteran pointing to you, 
I imagine over the years you've had interactions with veterans, you know, of course, a lot of veterans wear their hats and you can identify them and talk with them. I imagine you've talked with other Vietnam vets and I imagine in these discussions, they've asked you, well, what did you do? And you said, I was a medic. What kind of responses have you had since the war from other Vietnam vets when they, when they learned that you were a medic in the war? Well, that was interesting because I wanted absolutely nothing to do with the military. When I came home, I walked out November 10, 1970, a discharged. And when I would get letters from the VA for my information, I would throw them in the trash. They started sending them return receipts, so I had to sign for them. Uh, but mm. then they went in the trash. So they knew I was getting them. Yeah. In 20, 2001, uh, two, two, yeah, uh, 2001, I was in San Diego and I got a letter asking me to go in for a Agent Orange uh, physical and they, man, they did everything over two day period uh, because I was exposed to Agent Orange. And then I didn't have anything to do with them again until I came up to Eureka in 2002. And again, the person I was hired by was a veteran. He asked if, do you go to the VA? I said, no. He said, go over there or you're fired. And I went over there, they were closed that day. Mm -hmm. So that was the end of that. And I didn't go until about four years ago. Um, and wow. so, at that time, I, that's when I started learning that people had respect for medics. I, was, wow. I, I didn't have any clue that people had respect for medics until then. Wow. And since then, what sort of responses have you got? Say, in a waiting room, you're talking with another Vietnam vet at the VA. What did you do and what did you do? And then you say, I was a medic. What, what sort of responses have you got from your fellow, from your fellow vets? Well, I'm, I'm on Facebook specifically for Vietnam veteran groups and people would ask what, what, what? And so I changed my name there to Larry Doc Butcher. And that way they know I was a medic. And it's just, er everybody just thinks medics walk on water and we don't and one of the people in one of my ptsd groups said in his mind i'm a hero and i said and he is also a combat medic in vietnam and i said no i'm not i said on one occasion i was frozen with fear and and I couldn't move. And I know what it's like to be frozen with fear. Mm. Younger veterans have a huge, re huge respect for Vietnam veterans. And I appreciate that very much. Mm. And everyone that thanks me for my service, I thank them. And I appreciate them saying that we, when we came home, we were not welcomed. As a, I had my own office as a dispensing optician, and on the wall about eight years ago, I put a picture of my platoon on the top, and at the bottom, a article that of an operation in Vietnam. I put that on my wall, and every time someone would look at it, I would go talk to them, and and during my, the time I was in the office, I had three different ladies come to me and apologize personally for protesting actively against us. Wow. And they all said it wasn't you. And I feel bad that we protested and saying it was you. And I really appreciated them and I thank them for that. This was in Northern California? Eureka, California, yes. Yeah, that's the far north, if I have that right. Yes. 
you said that you went through a couple of days of screening for um, ailments related to Agent Orange. Have you had any Agent Orange related troubles? I, in 1907, uh, uh, no, 2015, get my years, mm -hmm. 2015, my wife is Thai. She was visiting her family in Thailand. <clears throat> And I uh, went to work on a Thursday morning, uh, started to throw up before I opened the office and I had to go home. I couldn't eat or drink. Friday, I went to work a normal day. And then Saturday morning, about 2 a.m., I was awakened with a severe pain in my neck on the left side. Mm -hmm. I took aspirin, went back to bed. I couldn't sleep. So I got up and got dressed, sat down on the couch and fell asleep. That morning, about 10 o'clock, I woke up and I thought I should go to the hospital. No, I'll go Monday. No, Monday, I'll go to work. So I drove myself to Mad River Hospital in Arcata that morning, walked in and said, I think I need to be checked out. The doctor came back alarmed. He said, you are having a heart attack. Wow. He called St. Joseph's in Eureka and I could hear his voice. He was very alarmed. And he came back, said, they'll accept you. I went by ambulance over to St. Joseph's and I went from table to table, had a double bypass. I had the left anterior descending artery blockage. That's the one they call the widow maker. Mm. And I was in ICU four days, another three days recovery. My wife found out about this in Thailand. She immediately flew home and the VA covered everything as it was Agent Orange uh, affiliated. So, yes. Wow. Wow. Mm, yeah, the Army veteran I talked with today, I mean, you know, the topic of Agent Orange came up and all these decades later that um, it's such a, a major part of the story. You, you mentioned, um, a few minutes ago that you were written up for a silver star and then uh, received a bronze star with a, a V device, which if I remember correctly, stands for valor. Yes. Um, can you tell us what that was about? Why an officer wrote you up for a silver star? Yes, that, that was uh, Lieutenant Wazel Darzen and when I first arrived in Vietnam going out with the infantry, we went out on our search and destroys and the Arvins were our rear security. Mm. <clears throat> I was there during Vietnamization, which mm. transferred us to rear security and the Arvins were the ones that would go out on the search and destroy. Mm. That day we were out as rear security for the Arvins. They tripped a white phosphorus grenade booby trap. White phosphorus burns as long as there's oxygen until it's gone. <clears throat> Lieutenant Darzen was about 15 feet to my front, just a little bit to my right, stepped in a punji pit. Oh, his right foot went down in the pit, but he was able to land on his left knee and he didn't fall in. Uh, that day, I did everything I could do for the Arvins. Uh, I took one of the Arvin's blouse boots. I lifted that blouse area and underneath was bloused skin, a water blister, the same size as his military uniform. I covered it gently trying to not burst that bubble. And I would pour water over faces to give them a little bit of relief until I had no water in my canteen. And that's the day that the gentleman pointed at me and said, I know what a brave son of a bitch that man is. That was his very first day out there. And he said, I didn't act like there was anything wrong. As a medic, when you heard medic, it was like you were so focused. It was like blinders. You had no, no idea of what going, is going on around you except what you need to do. Wow. Um, just a few more questions. 
what you described here, you know, springing into action, you, you know, even a person with minimal knowledge of combat of medics, they'll, they'll have seen movies, you know, likely where you, you hear that cry go out medic, you know, shouting for the medic and, and the medic comes, you know what that sounds like in real life. Um, and you respond to that. You said a few minutes ago when, you know, when this man said, you know, here's, here's a really brave soldier, or I'm sorry, I think this was at the PTSD um, meeting, um, a veteran, you know, referred to your bravery and your response was no, you know, a frozen fear. Um, without getting into anything that you don't want to discuss, um, can you just tell us just generally what the context of that was? Was that a situation where perhaps the you were going to be overrun by the Viet Cong? Can you just describe briefly what that context was that put you in that state where at least for a while you were paralyzed? Yes, we, we were flown out. Huey's uh, flew us out for a three-day Bushmaster. A Bushmaster was when you would go out, stay out. During the day, you would do search and destroy. Night, set up an ambush. Next day, search and destroy. And you'd do, stay out three days. When we first landed, uh, we discovered some booby traps. And so they left. Uh, as a medic, I was one of the last in a column. Behind me was the radio transmission operator, the RTO. Behind him was rear security. And on that day, I, they, the RTO and sergeant stayed back to put a, a charge on that to destroy the booby trap. They called on the radio, said fire in the hole 10 minutes. And I had a bevel on my watch specifically for this. I set it for 10 minutes within about one minute that it was a severe explosion. And I immediately knew that they had hit something. So I ran back and the RTO was on the ground on his back. <clears throat> and I was standing at his feet, uh, right at his feet and his chest had been blown out. Mm. And I was covering yelling for an urgent dust off. And as I was doing that, a forward observer, our artillery had FOs, forward observers out with us uh, to talk to artillery. He heard me yelling, but didn't know what I was saying. And he started walking toward me. He was probably 20, 30 feet away from me. He reached up, grabbed a stick, and he was blown up. And now I knew there's three. Well, we had different types of booby traps in Vietnam. Some, if you stepped on them, when you lifted your foot, it, they would explode. And so I stood there absolutely frozen with fear, looking at the ground around my feet, looking for trip wires around the person that I was there with. And I absolutely, was frozen, could not move. I was afraid to lift my feet. And eventually I just thought, if it's my time, it's my time and just go about my business. And I did. Wow. But I, for a moment, I couldn't, I was so frozen with fear, I could not move. Jeez. You say in what you wrote, um... The quote, my wartime experiences changed me. Based on everything you've said in this discussion, um, it seems almost like a, a stupid question. You know, how did your wartime experiences change you? But let me let me pitch the question this way. So you drafted 69, you extend in Vietnam. How long are you actually in South Vietnam then in three corps altogether? I was in just a second, I, I've got this because I thought you might ask that question. I was in active duty in the military one year, six months, and 10 days. I was in Vietnam one year, six, 
uh, wait a minute, one year, one month, and four days. Wow. So I went to basic AIT, 30-day leave, Vietnam discharged. Good grief. But before you came home, I mean, did you have a month of decompression time no. on the beach in Cameron Bay? Or did you pretty much go right from the field to, uh, did you fly out of Tansonut, just right, you know, right from the field to Tansonut to home? Now you're back in Spain closed. I mean, was there any decompression time at all? Absolutely. Well, uh, uh, no. However, uh, 25th Infantry Division was being closed down in Vietnam, brought back to Hawaii. And so they were really bringing troops back. This was the end of 1970. Yeah. And I got from the aid station, I got the notice to go over and for clearance. Well, once I was in clearance, uh, we were put in a holding area and they would call out names and those people were going to get on a plane to come home. Mm -hmm. I went to roll call three times a day, listening for my name for six days. My name was called on day six. So then we we're put in a group, uh, changed, uh, taken everything taken away from us. We're put on a bus to go down to the airport. Uh, someone, the buses started to move out. Someone was yelling, waving. They backed the buses up. They took us off. We sat behind the concertina wire or a, uh, a, uh, it's a, anyway, a wire for 24 hours. They said the plane was under repair. We sat on the ground. They brought food and water, but we had no cots or anything. We just sat on the ground for 24 hours. They took us to the airplane where we flew directly home, uh, but there was no time at all other than that six days. Wow. So then to come back to the question I was formulating, 6970, this is your time of service. You say you write that your wartime experience changed you. How was the Larry Butcher of 1968 different from the Larry Butcher of 1972 or 1971? Of course, you've aged a bit, and this is a very formative part of your life. But as, as a result of your experience in Vietnam, how is the Larry Butcher of 1968, the year before you go into the service, different from the Larry Butcher of 1971, the year after your service, as a result of that time in Vietnam? When I was drafted and I was just still, in my mind, a kid, just a teenager, quote unquote, type kid, innocent, when I was flying home from Vietnam, I was wondering if I had lost the ability to feel because I had only cried once and then I didn't after that. And I was wondering if I had lost the ability to feel. But when I walked out of the Oakland base that night, I was just as tough, just as tall, just as equal to any other man. No one stood taller than me. Mm. Since your time in Vietnam, you know, reflecting back on, going back to the beginning of the discussion, your grandfather saying, here's a motorcycle, go to Mexico. Your dad lived in Mexico. They're encouraging you not to avoid Vietnam. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, to avoid Vietnam, to not go into the service. Have you ever looked back and thought, you know, maybe I should have just stayed in Mexico? Not a chance. That decision, sitting in Arizona and deciding to do the right thing, the honorable thing, was one of the most important decisions of my life. And there isn't anyone that walks on the face of the earth that is more proud of their service than me. Mm. I hear you, I hear you. 
Well, Larry Butcher, I really appreciate you taking the time to share these memories. I know that we've touched only very lightly on, you know, what would be an extensive story, uh, but I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you for what you've written about your service. Um, is there anything else that comes to your mind that you would like to like to share before we wrap this up? I want everyone in America to know they can be and should be proud of the Americans that served in Vietnam. We were honorable and I want to thank you for what you're doing also. Well, well, well thank you again. It's been great to talk with you. I really appreciate it. Thank you.